two cell signaling. And hopefully in cardiovascular phys, maybe even in exercise phys or previous classes, you've talked a little bit about the uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone, you know, pathways. And we really care about those in human physiology, cardiovascular physiology. Because they're going to be involved in both the regulation of blood volume and systemic vascular resistance, which those are going to have a pretty profound impact on cardiac output and your overall arterial pressure, which is going to be a really important thing if you're thinking about, you know, the response to exercise, if you're talking about patient populations in which you're trying to maintain a normal arterial pressure, so you've got someone with hypertension or heart failure, or those various things. They're likely going to be on some ACE inhibitor, and it's going to be working through this pathway. And now we're not going to get into the depths uh, you know, this semester on, and hopefully maybe it's even been covered in others. That's why I've left it out somewhat on you know, how ACE inhibitors and blocking this pathway would impact the exercise responses. That'd be something I think you'd get in, in exercise testing and prescription. But we're going to get into a little bit of what are the things that are driving this response. So I'll start with this figure, and then I'll kind of highlight some things below that are worth knowing. So we've got our kidneys, and it's going to respond to a variety of things. But in this setting, we're talking about some increases in sympathetic nerve activity. If the kidneys experience a, a drop in pressure or a drop in sodium delivery to the distal tubules, the kidney is going to respond by producing renin. That renin is then going to get, get converted to angiotensin 1 by the angiotensinogen. We then have our ACE enzyme that's going to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. That angiotensin 2, and really we're going to talk about how we get from, from the release of renin, talk about this step here, then we'll talk about how angiotensin 2 binds to its receptor and actually gets us this increase in, in vascular resistance, how it's going to impact the smooth muscle and actually give us this resistance that's going to drive the arterial pressure. We'll not get into the blood volume control sort of things, you know, uh, really, as for the exercise physiologist, we're more concerned on the, the vascular resistance side of things. So I don't really need to highlight much here. Uh, I, I will, but we're going to talk just briefly about these things below. So, and that we've got these basic steps. Okay, so I went over that. Now I'll just highlight some of the things I've said. So we'll start at the beginning. We get the release of in, in, yeah, renin. I'm more concerned that, you know, that you know less about it being a proteolytic enzyme released by the kidneys. That should be fairly straightforward. I'm more interested in you knowing that it's going to be released by the sympathetic nerve activity. Renal artery hypotension. So it's not necessarily systemic arterial high, low blood pressure. If the, if the kidneys think it's got low blood pressure, it doesn't care what the, you know, this is where Tim Mush used to say, that, you know, the kidney was the dumbest organ in the body, is it would kill the body in an, an attempt to maintain its own blood pressure. You know, if it felt like it needed uh, higher blood pressure, it was going to do whatever it took to get it. And then sodium delivery, decreased sodium delivery. Don't really concern yourselves with the, to the distal tubules, the kidney just... Those are the three things that really drive renin release. There's others, but these are the big ones. As the figure described, we then get angiotensin 1 generation. It's a peptide hormone. You know, it's got some, uh, some cleavage of a peptide. Really, key thing is to know that it's the second step. Angiotensinogen uh, is the, the driver for this conversion. Angiotensin 2, it gives us, it occurs by the further cleavage of angiotensin 1 by the enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme, so our, our ACE. And so if you give someone an ACE inhibitor, it's just inhibiting this enzyme. And we see primarily this ACE activity in the lungs, especially within the endothelium of the pulmonary capillaries. That's likely stuff you've seen in other, in other classes. Where we're going to be starting our discussion is with the juxtaglomular cells. And they're going to be located, and let's start down here. 
They are associated with the afferent arterial entering the renal glomulus at the primary site of renin storage and release. So we've got here our afferent arterial, and the figure's a little bit blurry, but we've got all these vesicles within these cells that are, contain our renin. Put things into perspective. So this is our afferent arterial. We're talking about this spot right there. So we've got here, here's our renal artery, our renal vein. We've got our different segment and interlobular arteries, so on and so forth. And, you know, we zoom in on a small spot right here. So here's our interlobular arteries. We zoom into that. That's our interlobular artery. And then that breaks off in here into our Bowman capsule. And we get all our you know, the things that you learned in the human body on, on the renal side of things. But we're focused on right here, this afferent arterial that's entering the Bowman capsule. So let's look at these cells. I'm not going to get into the depths of how we're going from the messenger RNA to our final renin molecule. Just so you know, there's this, they call it pre-pro-renin, and that, and that goes to pro-renin, and then you get final renin. And here's our Golgi apparatus. And really what happens is the Golgi apparatus, we've got these two pathways of exocytosis, this can uh, the constitutive pathway and the regulated pathway, and I thought about getting into the depths of it, but it's really confusing and confusing. And for what you guys need to know, that's that's really just beyond uh, what's really important at this point. But really, just recognize that we you know we go from our messenger RNA, we get our renin, and we've got this process of exocytosis where we've we've stimulated this cell to increase renin released into the circulation. And so really the main thing is just this exocytosis. So since this is really the first step in this whole pathway, we need to understand what are the things, what are the signals, and how are we stimulating this increase in, in renin. And at the cellular level, we've got a lot of different factors, but it, it really converges down to, to three messenger systems, cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP, and calcium. And we really will talk about cyclic AMP and GMP together uh, because GMP kind of interacts with the cyclic AMP. So these are our, it's regulated by these three intracellular second messenger systems. So we regard cyclic AMP as the central intracellular stimulator of renin release. That's important because we'll talk about calcium being as the primary uh, inhibitor of this. So calcium is the primary central stimulator. And we can get, <clears throat> excuse me, activation of cyclic AMP. I'll focus primarily here on, we talked about sympathetic nerve activity. So you get this increased sympathetic nerve activity and that's going to drive this release of, of renin. So if we've got beta-1 adrenergic receptors, in, on our uh, juxtacellular glomular cells, so down here's our cell, you know, here's our, our receptor, here could be our beta receptor. So if we activate these receptors, we've already talked briefly throughout the semester about beta receptors. You know, and they're going to enhance adenylate cyclase activity, which is going to promote cyclic AMP, and that cyclic AMP is going to stimulate renin secretion. And that's really the basic steps. You know, we, so the figure here just has it as this is a subtype of adenylate cyclase, so five and six. Don't worry about the, that part. Just focus on the AC, the adenylate cyclase. That's going to give us cyclic AMP. And then my point nine, which I'll go back up and highlight, we really don't know much about how we get from cyclic AMP to this release of blunt renin. Very rarely do we see a figure like this where it's really, we don't know a whole lot. There's some evidence that uh, PKA is involved here. So we'll just throw that in here. We've got pretty decent evidence that that's involved. But this is our nice, you know, thinking about our sequence of events that are worth knowing. We go from cyclic AMP, uh, adenylate cyclase to cyclic AMP to PKA to the release of renin. This Cyclic AMP levels are not only going to be determined by this adenylate cyclase formation, 
but through the, also through the activity of cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase, so PDEs. And you, you see that come up quite a bit in endothelial cells and dealing with nitric oxide. I believe Dr. Benke gets into some of that as, in, uh, in his class. It's just important to bring up here because we can, uh, you know, there's a, a large drug class at which target various physiological systems that are under this classification of uh, PDE, PDEs. So basically, if we have phosphodiesterase within the cell, it's going to promote the conversion of cyclic AMP back to AMP. And we can inhibit phosphodiesterase via cyclic GMP. I'm really just bringing this up as a this might be something you need you hear down the road. I'm not going to ask you on it on the exam. It's a little bit confusing. It took me a little while to wrap my head around it because it was a concept that I hadn't really dove into much in the past. But just recognize that you may come across literature where the phosphodiesterase inhibitors or cyclic GMP, you know, are involved in this process. So I'm, I'm not going to highlight any of this point. Eight. It's just FYI type of information. The only thing here that's worth... Uh, really devoting to memory is this, we've got this PKA dependent step in our sequence. So if cyclic AMP is our primary stimulator of the release of renin, calcium is the opposite, the primary inhibitor. This comes at kind of a paradox because if you look in a lot of other cells, calcium is a main driver for exocytosis. Um, if I remember right, in the neural cells, so if you're talking about a synapse, calcium is a major component of the exocytosis for the release of, of things like acetylcholine. And that's why when you get into this literature and, and the concept of renin release, you'll also come across the term calcium paradox. It's basically mean calcium here is doing the exact opposite of most everywhere else. Uh, it, so it's a little bit of a paradox. Why here versus others? It's, it's unknown. So normally it increases uh, calcium concentration, initiates and supports exocytosis. But here it's doing the exact opposite. And that's where we get this calcium paradox. Downstream. So we'll go back to our figure from above. So here's our calcium. This would be our endoplasmic reticulum. We could also have calcium channels within our, our cell. We get calcium coming in, and it can work in two ways. It, we know it can impact the adenylate cyclase and prevent the formation of cyclic AMP. There's also some evidence that it's actually going to have some impact down here, although we don't know exactly how, and it will prevent this release of renin via exocytosis. But we do know downstream target, as we've got this calcium coming from either the ER, from extracellular, by these channels, and it's blocking this, this pathway. So those are the, the main things. There are quite a few other ways in which we can stimulate renin release. But these are kind of the, the two big players when it comes to the control of the release of renin within the kidneys. What we're going to focus our attention now, and really the majority of our efforts, is to understanding angiotensin II and what it's doing within the systemic circulation and the control of primarily vascular smooth muscle. So let's start with the receptor. We know from the entire semester that the receptor is the first step, and we, we've got to understand it to really understand what's happening from there and that there are components of this receptor that really can drive the final response. So we know that most of the known physiological effects of angiotensin II are mediated by this angiotensin type 1 receptor. There are other types of angiotensin receptors, but it's really this AT1. So we're only going to focus on that. Important. And possible exam question would be, you know, list one or two organs that you would find angiotensin type 1 receptors. So we see it on the liver, the adrenal glands, brain, lung, kidney, heart, and peripheral vasculature. And we're going to focus more on vascular smooth muscle today. 
as that's going to be our driver of sympathetic nerve activity. But we're going to see these receptors in all these locations. Receptors, they're part of the G-protein coupled receptor family, as we talked about a few months ago. So it's going to work in a very similar way of all the other G-protein receptors we've looked at this semester, the same basic components. And, and hopefully, you know, it's not too much new material. It's just kind of putting the pieces in place here. And we want to focus on this, on this receptor because there's quite a bit of evidence that not only the density of the receptor, but the, the polymorphisms, I guess is the word I really want to use, of this gene and of these receptors are really linked to the development of a lot of cardiovascular risk factors and the development of cardiovascular disease. And I've got some really interesting points here towards the end of this page that, that are quite fascinating when you're thinking about this receptor and these linked to these risk factors. So it's important that, you know, we kind of understand this receptor. And one study is even saying that a, an association between different types of this receptor especially at the genetic level, like down at the DNA, and angiotensin II sensitivity. So obviously, if you're more sensitive to angiotensin II, you're going to get a bigger response and may drive some of the adverse cardiovascular components. It also can go undergo dimerization with other receptors, most notably beta-2 adrenergic receptors. So if you've got Basically, what's happening is our angiotensin receptor and our beta-2 adrenergic receptors, they link up and, you know, they can enhance each other's activity. So when we get this dimerization, we can enhance the vasoconstrictive effects of angiotensin too. So it's just like supercharging a car. We really enhance the ability of angiotensin II to have its vasoconstrictive effects. This table's great because now we're thinking about within the cardiovascular system, particularly vascular smooth muscle cells, so these VSMCs, what's going to upregulate and downregulate the density of these receptors? Remember, we talked just briefly about the different ways at which we can alter receptor density. Those same things are going to be happening here, and we're going to see an upregulation of these angiotensin 1 receptors with low density lipids concentrations, insulin, urethroproetin. These first two I'll talk a little bit more about just briefly, but think about conditions in which these would be elevated. Things that would downregulate it, uh, we know that angiotensin II just acutely, we'll talk that about that, but chronic levels can downregulate it. Things like estrogen, largely thought to be very protective within the cardiovascular system. Some vitamins, nitric oxide, all kind of come into play. I don't need to highlight anything from this particular uh, table. I'll do that down here in these next few points. So acutely, angiotensin II is going to increase this receptor activation. Chronic exposure tends to downregulate its own receptors. So if I'm constantly stimulating these angiotensin II receptors, they do appear to downregulate. Where it gets a little tricky is you start thinking about, you know, cardiovascular disease patients, individuals are kind of at risk. We've got other things that are driving its upregulation. So uh, it kind of gets to be a, a challenge in understanding what's happening. This point 18 is interesting, at least I think so. So, you know, LDL, low density lipids, have been shown to upregulate the, the concentration of these angiotensin 1 receptors by stabilizing the messenger RNA that makes these receptors. So it's going to upregulate these AT1s. And there's actually some physiologic consequences to this. You know, the problem with a lot of molecular biology is that, oh, we see this relationship. Well, what does it actually have an impact on your, on your individual or your patient? Well, we know that angiotensin II, we give that to someone who's got hypercholesterolemia, they have a greater amount of vasoconstriction to angiotensin II. If I just expose them to AT2, they're going to see a greater amount of vasoconstriction. Why? More receptors. If we give that same hypercholesterolemic male statin therapies, which is kind of this, the common way in which we, uh, we deal with hypercholesterol, or high cholesterol, 
we see improvements in in this vasoconstriction. It's very likely that these statins are having an impact on this density. And this point C I really like. This link between low density lipids and the upregulation of these angiotensin 1 receptors, type 1 receptors, gives us molecular evidence of the association between hyperlipidemia and hypertension. Think about it. A lot of people have both of these. Same thing. Point 19, insulin upregulates angiotensin type 1 receptor gene expression. Again, via this stabilization, we now have molecular evidence of an association between hyperinsulinemia and hypertension. You guys ever heard of a thing called metabolic syndrome? There's a lot of different classifications for it, but it's usually the combined hypercholesterol, High, uh, hyperinsulinemia and hypertension. They're all linked molecularly, and one way in which it may be is through these angiotensin 1 type receptors. So they're not these individual things, there is interaction within the cardiovascular system. Okay, so we've got this receptor, we can change its density. What's actually happening if we stimulate it? And we've got a variety of ways in which and signaling cascades in which this is going to take place. And it's primarily doing it by G protein dependent signaling pathways. We've already mentioned that this angiotensin type 1 receptor is, is part of a G protein coupled receptor, so it makes sense that the G protein is going to be involved. So I'll just highlight that here. This Point 22 is a little redundant because I'm going to bring this up in really the rest of this lecture. But what I'm going to show here over the next few pages is this angiotensin type 1 receptor is coupled to G proteins which activate phospholipase C, phospholipase A2, and phospholipase D. So this makes like a nice multiple choice style question, you know, which of the three are, are activated by angiotensin 2 and these type 1 receptors. So these next few points are, may seem a little bit overwhelming. But again, think about the style of question I'm going to ask you. It's, it's going to be, if you just understand the sequence of events, and I'll highlight in the figure the steps that I think are important here. And most of these steps you've seen at least a half a dozen times throughout the semester. So I'm going to start with my figure since you guys don't need to do much writing here. So here's our angiotensin 2. This is going to be in a vascular smooth muscle. We have our angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor, so our 7 membrane linked to our G protein. So remember a G protein's got alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. We bind here and we activate this the same way we learned a few months ago and what happens is our, our G protein activates phospholipase C. Activation of phospholipase C gives us our DAG molecule and our IP3. And like always, I'll, I'll give you both the, the name and the, and the abbreviation. So we've got angiotensin 2, activates our receptor. We get activation of phospholipase C, and that gives us a DAG molecule and an IP3 molecule. As in all the other pathways that are G protein linked with the phospholipase C and the DAG and the IP3, is that our IP3 results in calcium release. It goes down to our sarcoplasmic reticulum, the calcium goes up, and that calcium is going to have consequences. That calcium, so here's a IP3, goes to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and gives us our calcium. So next step is calcium. So we get calcium efflux. Calcium binds with calmodulin. <coughs> We're in smooth muscle. What happens when you increase calcium in smooth muscle? 
you get contraction. From there, you get an increase in systemic vascular resistance and an increase in blood pressure. So we get the calmodulin. Then, you know, the next step is the myosin light chain kinase. Really, for you guys, the next step is smooth muscle uh, contraction. We also have, and I don't have really shown up here. Uh, make sure I don't have this shown up here. Yeah, I don't have it shown here. Is that we also have, you know, the calcium activating protein kinase C. That protein kinase C is going to have an impact on the MAP kinase pathway. So it's not drawn out here or anywhere. You know, you could put an arrow and, and have MAP kinases. I'm not going to focus too much on that here. Uh, but it's important because one of the consequences of, of high blood pressure, those with cardiovascular, increased cardiovascular risk, is if you, well, actually, if you think back to our angiogenesis lecture, I mentioned that you see a thickening of the arterial walls in those who are high cardiovascular risk, and especially those with hypertension. And angiotensin II is likely playing a key role there because with this MAP kinase pathway, it, it has some growth promoting effects. So you get smooth muscle cell proliferation, you get these thick walls. And in those thick walls, you get consequences because it changes the, you know, the extracellular matrix and, and you've got now very stiff vessels and that has hemodynamic consequences. Not really going to worry about that, but just understand that that's kind of come into play. I'm really going to focus this lecture on things that are giving us smooth muscle contraction, the angiotensin II. Okay, so that's that's where we, we get our phospholipase C pathway. So that's over here. Here, now we're talking about phospholipase D. So here's our angiotensin II, binds to our seven transmembrane angiotensin type one receptor. Here's our G proteins. And instead of it being phospholipase C now, it can also activate this phospholipase D, which gives us phosphatidic, or phosphatidic acid, this PA. So let's just highlight a few things. Receptor, phospholipase D now gives us this phosphatidic acid that gets converted to DAG. That's going to lead to sustained activation of PKC. It's also going to promote sustained contraction. So it's really promoting this pathway. So we get PDL, PLD activation, phosphatidic, DAG, sustained PKC activation, smooth muscle contraction. And we know this is important in at least pathologic hypertension because if we take rats that, that are hypertensive, this Phospholipase C, phospholipase D pathway that causes this smooth muscle contraction. They're very much augmented in hypertensive brass compared to those controls. And that's telling us is that something about hypertension, we're not only seeing this increased renin and this increased number of uh, <clears throat> angiotensin II and an increased number of receptors, there's actually something changing. There's something different in a hypertensive rat that's this pathway is much easier to go through in a hypertensive rat. So, you know, you stimulate these receptors in a hypertensive rat, it's going to even promote further this contraction. So it's really a snowball effect that's taking place here. So that's just an interesting and important thing to know, is that these pathways that cause contraction are augmented in hypertensive rats. The third one is our phospholipase A2, and this is a, a little bit different uh, series of steps than we've talked about before, but we're now over here on the far right, so angiotensin II, our transmembrane receptor, G proteins. In this case, you know, we're able to activate 
You know, so really these receptors can activate one of three of these or all three of them at any given time. So here we're getting this phospholipase A2 activation. So angiotensin 2 binds to our receptor, phospholipase A2. And that gives us the production of arachidonic, arachidonic acid. One of the metabolites of arachidonic acid is this H-E-T-E. So I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that, which is why I'll for sure give you the H-E-T-E's. But it gives you this, and it really promotes the release of calcium and the binding of calcium to calmodulin. So it's going to, you know, it's a prohypertensive, leads to angiotensin mediated smooth muscle contraction by facilitating calcium in, into the cell. So it's going to really promote this other pathway. It's going to promote calcium and therefore promote smooth muscle contraction. So this HTES facilitates calcium entry into the cell. So these are the direct ways in which angiotensin II elicits smooth muscle contraction. And a lot of times you think, ah, oh, well, we've got nitric oxide, it's going to override things and all is going to be great and good in the world and, and we're not going to really have to worry about it. The problem is, is that angiotensin II also elicits oxidative stress. So this ties back into our reactive oxygen species lecture. So if we've got angiotensin II, it, it promotes that oxidative stress, and it does through, through this NADPH oxidase that's in our vascular smooth muscle. It's going to promote superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. And as a result of these reactive oxygen species, they have to bind, you know, they're going to take this nitric oxide that would normally go and elicit smooth muscle relaxation and, and have all of its antiatherogenic properties. It can't do that. It's got to deal with these reactive oxygen species. So it has to, you know, it gets bound up, can't do its job, and as a result, we get reduced nitric oxide-mediated relaxation. And this is where exercise can come into play. So you think about the beneficial effects of exercise in, uh, let's just say, hypertension. You know, if we can improve nitric oxide bioavailability, so we do exercise training, we know it's going to do that. There's some dietary intervention, so... Jacob Caldwell, my uh, doctoral student, is using dietary nitrates, which increase nitric oxide bioavailability. And he's, so far, knock on wood, will continue to show that in patients diagnosed with hypertension, improving this nitric oxide improves smooth muscle relaxation during exercise and allows them to better deal with increases in sympathetic nerve activity and obviously that's going to have not only beneficial effects to their health, but over, hopefully, we'll see in future studies, maybe exercise performance or, or exercise tolerance. You know, they're not going to go out and run necessarily a marathon, but they may have physically challenging jobs and just the quality of life. So key things here, angiotensin II, potent mediator of oxidative stress, does so through NADPH oxidase. and results in reduced nitric oxide mediated relaxation. So this angiotensin II molecule really has a profound impact at all levels and really links up to multiple cardiovascular related risk factors or diseases that are related to, to CVD and then can have a profound impact, impact if you start thinking about the responses to exercise. You've got smooth muscle vasoconstriction. You've got decreased nitric oxide bioavailability. It's no wonder that their blood flow response to exercise sucks and their exercise tolerance is down. All of these things come into play and they all serve as targets for not only drug therapy, but maybe even exercise interventions. So angiotensin two, it's no good. Questions? Okay, so let's, before you take off here, uh, let's 